Sobieski. I'm from Reddy Herding and some fishing culture called Sami. We've been living off the land here for thousands of years. I've been helping with these guys with the salmon research for the last couple of years. I have to say it's been an eye-opening experience to really learn what the salmon are doing in the river. These parts of Futsuki here are one of the best spawning areas of the whole river. Pretty normal at this time of year to see the salmon fighting here. A couple of minutes ago we filmed with the drone that there are three big salmons, a couple of females and a really large male getting ready for spawning. This is a unique river and although populations are alarmingly declining, these giants are still here. So there is hope that if proper action is taken, we have the power to reserve this. One of the largest Atlantic salmon populations in the world and possibly the most diverse. With several distinct subpopulations divided between variable tributaries and areas of the mainstream, there is 1300 kilometres of river available for the Atlantic salmon to migrate. These types of studies are a key part in learning more about Atlantic salmon biology and allows for more effective conservation protocols to be applied in the future. All of the live history strategies of the Atlantic salmon are present within the large system. There are from two pounder grills of smaller tributaries to multi-sea winter fish up to 60 pounds of the mainstream. There's also large respawn of females and sexually mature par of only 12 centimetres. The females carefully clean their reds from any organic material. While the large males fight for the best females to spawn with. Meanwhile, smaller males and sexually mature pars wait further away for an opportunity to join the spawning at the last moment. The Tenno River separates the northern Finland from Norway, and more importantly to fishermen, this river is well known as being one of the most productive salmon fisheries in the world. not an easy run up the river. There are hungry predators all the way, humans not being the least of them. The salmon then need to travel around 100 kilometers upstream of the Tenor before they reach the mouth of the Utsioki River. And it is here where the wild Atlantic salmon make their way up the Utsioki River. Utsioki was chosen for the study because it's big enough that it includes all of the life history strategies of the Atlantic salmon in the Tenno system, but it's still small enough to be manageable for the fishing effort so that we can expect to catch and sample the majority of all the spawners in the area. But we still need to use rather effective fishing methods, so it's basically gill nets and drift nets to do the job. After the adult sampling, we need to compare the DNAs to their offspring. And for that we use electrofishing methods to catch roughly 2000 salmon fry samples of the same year. And we cut their adipose fin after which we release the salmon fry back into the river, hopefully to make it into adulthood. And occasionally we do catch adult salmon here that are still missing the adipose fin, meaning that those fish have actually been sampled as juveniles maybe even seven or eight years previously. And then we can compare the DNAs of the juveniles to the adults of the previous spawning season and make a parentage analysis to study the reproductive success of each adult salmon specifically. The juvenile salmon spend on average three to five years in Utsiogi, after which they become smolts and migrate into the ocean. They feed in the ocean from one to five years before returning to spawn as adult salmon and the growth rate of the fish is really fast 
and they can even triple their weight during one year. So a fish that returns into Teno after four to five years can reach up to 60 pounds. The salmon fishing season in Teno system ends early August and this study is done under a study fishing license and we begin the fishing in mid-September and continue all the way up to early October at which time usually the salmon spawning peaks in Utsioki. The salmon spawning season usually is around one month in length with male salmon being active the whole month and the female salmon being active just for one week within that time frame. This year the conditions are especially challenging because the water level is almost record low and even the boating by itself is difficult in the dark but also our fishing options are more limited than usual. The drift netting doesn't work in certain places and also we are limited in the spots that we can apply the gill nets but still we are expecting that if the fish come into Utsjagi, the majority of them will be caught and sampled. So usually around 10 p.m. we start to observe fish are starting to move in from Teno mainstream and then we are starting to catch them in the nets. To keep the fish safe and alive and well, we have to check the nets regularly and often to prevent them from suffocating once they get caught. We also try to observe the river with headlamps to spot unsampled fish that we can try to catch actively with a drift net. This is a specially good method to keep the fish in proper condition because we can immediately get them out of the net after they have been caught. After the fish is caught we transfer it back to our base camp and we sample it for DNA. So basically we take a small section of their adipose fin and few of the scales to determine the sea age and the juvenile stages of the whole life history of the fish. And we also tag the fish to immediately recognize pre-caught fish. After the sampling the fish will wait in a large keep net until the fishing is done for the night after which we will release them back into the river to continue their spawning run. This is just to prevent them from getting re-caught immediately after release to prevent excessive stressing of the fish. Most of the salmon in Utsiaki are one sea winter males weighing roughly two kilos or five pounds. But then we also have multi sea winter individuals. Almost all of the female salmon are at least three sea winters of age, meaning that they are over one meter in length, over 10 kilos or 20 pounds in weight. And occasionally we run across really large male salmon that are somewhere between four and five sea winters. And those can weigh over 50 pounds, some rare individuals reaching all the way over 60 pounds. Those fish most likely exist in the Teno system. They most likely have been caught previously, but very few, if any, have been well documented. And all of those largest of male salmon are first time spawners. So they don't have this repeat spawning strategy of the Atlantic salmon. They act almost like a Pacific salmon species. So they come in once and after they have done their spawning, they have wasted all their energy reserves and they are usually dead before the winter sets in. In Utsioki research, on average, only 10% of salmons left for spawning are females. During the research, our average catch is 81 adults, and of those 81, only 10.4% are females. Previous studies have shown that especially multi-sea winter females are disproportionately present in human-caused mortalities. This study has been going on annually since 2011 and for the first time ever researchers have been able to study the reproductive success of a healthy and diverse wild Atlantic salmon population. The challenge is to gene sample the majority of all the spawners. This data can then be used to study multiple aspects of salmon reproduction and population dynamics. 
One key question is, since the Tenor River system is composed of several subpopulation of different tributaries and parts of the mainstream, since these populations are not completely isolated, do the local salmon have an advantage in reproductive success and to what degree? Studying this local adaption is made possible by the extensive salmon sample archive that has been collected in the Tenor system over several decades. Now it becomes possible to assess each salmon into their native population within the Tenor system and compare reproductive success between native and stray fish. happen here in the lab. So the main aim here is what we want to do is that we want to basically we need to purify the DNA from the fin samples that have been collected. All of these samples are from this year's, uh, this year's field work. They get delivered here to the lab at the University of Helsinki. What we say we extract the DNA from these fin samples. Basically we just purify away all of the other stuff so we're left with a pure sample of DNA that we can then use for doing our, our genetic analyses. The aim of the genetic analyses is that we want to basically do parentage testing for our fish. So we have the, the small juveniles that have been electrofished and we have the adults that have been caught on the spawning ground and we want to try and match up and see who are the mum and dads of those small juveniles using genetic methods, the same genetic methods that are used in any forensic laboratory around the world. This year, fishing for the adult salmon has been very, very bad. Unlike previous years, the first two weeks we haven't caught many fish at all. This could be due to the extremely low water and abnormally low rates of grills throughout the whole Tenor River system in 2019. Also, the water temperature was warmer than average. Last year, not a single fish over 15 kilos was caught and that has never happened in the history of the study. Is this another such year and does it mean that the number of large salmon are declining alarmingly in one of the last home rivers of these four to five sea winter giants? Then on September 23rd, while they are already taking out the nets after another quiet night, a huge salmon is spotted with the searchlight. They quickly go back to base camp to get a drift net to try and catch the fish, but they are unable to find it again. Disappointed, they start collecting away the few remaining stationary nets. Then on the very last net, the giant is found. This is definitely the largest Atlantic salmon they have ever seen and possibly a record size. The usual 25 kilo scale bottoms out and they need to get a bigger scale and wake up the rest of the crew to help. Yep. Whoa. Hold it there. Hold it there. Lift it down. Lift it down. Just just a brief pause. Close to 30. 30 something. 30 something, yes. Close to 30, but not quite. Okay, let's. One, two, three. Hold it steady. Fingers out of the way, Hans. Fingers out of the way. Fingers on the way. Yeah. It's slipping. It's over 30. My, oh, okay. Huge Atlantic salmon. Oh. 
Yes, okay. Mm. 28. Like a seal. Yeah, it's like a seal. The light, light shining, so. It's level here and 134.5. Okay. Okay, 134.5, so. Yeah, 28. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, 28. <laughs> that's your that's your name. <laughs> Let's go hunt some females. But still it had some uh, bite marks on the face. Yeah, I noticed that dude. This is like a uh, like round shape the tail. It's like <laughs> round. <laughs> that's pretty amazing shape. It's like one, two, two hand sizes wide. The giant fish is sampled and tagged, but the group decide to put it in a keep net and return the next day with an official scale and more people to assist with the weigh-in. So once we have all of that parentage data, there's a couple of questions that we're interested in looking at, really aiming to understand why there are salmon of different sizes, like why do some individuals return to spawn when they're on this size? And why do others decide to spend many more years in the sea growing large, but risk dying while they're at sea before they go back to try and reproduce for the first time, but then they end up being these huge monsters. We're talking about trade-offs, like why risk not reproducing at all just to get big? Is it really worth it? And if so, how much added value is there in being large as a salmon on the, on, on the spawning grounds? What our uh, research shown is that there is in fact a uh, very large benefit. If you make it back to the spawning grounds as a large male or female, you do have much higher reproductive success. So you're producing, or you're many more kids, basically, um, which in an evolutionary biology sense, that's the aim. It's to sort of get your genes getting onto the next generation so that they can then, those uh, characteristics uh, pass through to the next generations and then potentially your offspring also will have higher reproductive success or what we call higher reproductive fitness. A second angle that we're interested in understanding is, is that are there any benefits for having local knowledge on the spawning grounds? So Atlantic salmon, they have very high level of genetic structuring so that the genetic profiles of one section of the Tano River are very different to the genetic profiles of other sections of the Tenno River upstream or downstream. So what that suggests is that there must be a, an advantage to going back to the place where you hatched yourself to spawn, that you have some kind of local advantage, that we would call it local adaptation. And so what we've also been able to show is that of those adults, we can identify based on their genetic profiles, which part of the Tenno River they hatched in. And what we've been able to show, the individuals that make it back to the same spawning ground they have up to 10 times more offspring than other individuals that have dispersed from, from somewhere else and that aren't locals. So that the locals are having much higher reproductive fitness than the dispersers. Here is a graph that is showing five years of samples from the spawning site. You can see the older and the bigger the fish are, the more offspring they are having on average. The other thing you can see is the home ground advantage of the locals. Most individuals are locals, but about 10 to 15% seem to be males that have dispersed from somewhere else. And as you can see in all sea ages, the orange dot, the locals, is always higher than the blue dot, showing there is a higher reproductive success for the locals compared to the dispersers. In males, it's about three to four times more offspring for the locals, and in females, it's about 10 times more offspring. These results highlight the importance of subpopulation level conservation. The Atlantic Salmon's official weight came in at 27.4 kilograms, which is 60.3 pounds, and this is a current tie with the largest official Atlantic Salmon record in Finland. 
to our knowledge, this is the largest living Atlantic salmon in the world to have been documented on film. What is the future of these giants? Are we witnessing the last one here, or can we conserve the genes of the 60 pounders for the future generations? Salmon that we just released was easily the biggest one that I have ever seen. I know a lot of people have caught bigger salmon than that in Teno. I've never heard a salmon that size being in Utsiaki. Those people who have gotten bigger salmon than in Teno, they are off the record. They haven't been weighed. I haven't seen them. So they are like the stuff of legends. But this one is official now. It's on official scales and it was a awesome experience to see and feel a salmon of that size.